Thank you, Justin. And thank you also to all of the organi organizers of today's event. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with all of you here today. I was thinking about talking for about 30 minutes and then taking questions and answers. And I know you're all very busy, so you're welcome to leave after the talk. Or if the talk's that bad, you can leave during, I guess. But I'm not going to lecture about how we must think or how we must talk about our, our environmental challenges. Rather, I'm going to consider how we might talk and think differently about some of those challenges. And you will all be making a lot of the decisions about the built and conceptual environment that we live in. And as such, I suspect you will be answering a lot of the questions that I'm struggling with. So this story that I'm telling today is far from settled. And so it's my hope that you will help complete it. So let's get started. The premise of my book, Green Illusions, is that green technologies are not what they seem that they might not be what you think they are, and they might not be the saviors that we think that they are. And I also argue that the idea of green technology, the possibilities of green technology, are based on a legacy thinking, a kind of thinking that will soon seem outdated. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So I wanted to start out uh, by saying that I didn't always question green energy. I once founded and operated a vertically integrated wind power operation in Michigan, and I was 12 years old. <laughs> now, I ran my short-lived wind power operation out of my parents' house, and behind our house was a garage. And inside the garage was a large wind turbine, thanks to my dad, dad's job at a uh, wind uh, or, or a fan manufacturer, industrial fan manufacturer. And I found a rusty steel pipe to use as an axle and then I had to build kind of this wooden frame to put it all in because my parents had neglected to teach me to weld. And they had also not helped me secure any funding for a tower, so I had to use a picnic table. And now one windy day, I hauled the frame up onto the table and I weighed it down with bricks. And then I lifted up the turbine assembly and I shoved it into the contraption. And there was very little time to enjoy my work because it already started to spin uncomfortably fast. And only really at that point did it become obvious that I had neglected to install a braking mechanism. So I took out one of the, the bricks and I was trying to slow it down because I thought, well, maybe if I slow it down a little bit, I can you know, take a little bit more time to appreciate this and, and, and look at it before it starts spinning. And I was pushing the brick and it just sparked and hissed and the steel sails just effortly, effortlessly uh, accumulated greater velocity. And the picnic table started to vibrate after a little while. And I, I, had, I realized I had kind of created something that was like an upended lawnmower, kind of thumping through the air with a quickening rhythm. And what happened thereafter can only be deduced, because by that point, uh, my adrenaline-filled legs had already carried me halfway around the house. The clamor and howling eventually stopped abruptly. And when I returned, I found an empty picnic table in flames. Now, this was just the first of many failures in my life. We don't have to go through all of them. But when I was 17, I built uh, an electric car. It also ran on natural gas. And it wasn't fast. I'm pretty sure it was not safe. And it got stranded in the halls of my high school. Uh, but not before a photo op. Here's a little photo of it, a paper. Now, after that, I went to engineering school and then uh, worked on green tech for, in Europe for several years. And when I moved back to the United States, I decided to open uh, a green architectural firm in a historic district of Washington, D.C. And one of my first clients was a diplomat who wanted to live in a solar house. And of course, I loved solar cells, so that wasn't a problem. And he already had the building. My client's house was 100 years old, and around the same time, that house was built, someone had planted two oak trees on the western side of the house. By the way, would anyone like to guess why they planted that trees there? Shade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, shade. Well, actually, I've, I really don't know for sure if you're right because I was there 100 years ago to witness who it was uh, who, who planted them. But regardless, the trees were great. In the summer, they blocked the sun, and in the winter, the leaves would fall off and the sun could shine through the trees and warm the home's exterior. And as a result, the annual utility bills for this house were 
thousands of dollars less than a new house that had been built just down the street. And these trees had been doing this every year for a hundred years. And as a green architect, I was charged with the job of chopping them down. And that's because the solar cells demanded it, of course. You can't put solar cells on the roof of a shaded house. And I would soon find out that that was the first of many demands that the solar cells would make. And demand number two was for lots of money. If you read anything about solar cells these days, you'll be left with the impression that the cost curve looks something like this. But over the past decade, the installed cost of solar cells actually looked like this. Now, why is there such a discrepancy? Part is due to subsidies. These give the illusion of a price drop when really just someone else is paying for it. Also, journalists typically report on the technical components of solar cells, like polysilicon. But polysilicon represents less than a fifth of the cost of an installed solar system. And so even if the price of polysilicon dropped to zero, we'd still have to pay for the rest. And the rest is boring things like copper and glass and aluminum and fossil fuels and transportation and installation, uh, insurance, uh, things like rare earth metals and heavy metals, which brings us to the next concern of solar cells. They demand some pretty nasty stuff. Now, solar cell manufacturing involves the use or release of numerous toxic compounds and chemicals, uh, like this solar cell here. And thin film technologies contain cadmium. Uh, which is an extreme toxin. Now, what do we do with this at the end of its life? If we incinerate it, that stuff goes into the air and waterways. And if we bury it, it can end up in groundwater supplies. And very little of this is biodegradable. Now, today, solar cell generation is tiny. It supplies less than one-tenth of one percent of our energy needs. If this bucket represents North American energy consumption, then here's what the solar cell, cell, solar cell share would look like. Now, if solar cell production grows, so will the associated side effects. And to my dismay, the demands of the solar cells did not stop there. Now, the United Arab Emirates recently conducted one of the largest cross-comparison tests of solar technologies to date. And they did so because they were building this city called Mazdar City. And for this test, they gathered a whole bunch of solar cells from a lot of different suppliers, and they intended to find out which was the best solar cell. But when they started the test, that drew attention to something else, which was all of the disadvantages and limitations that the solar cells shared in common. Now, a desert might seem like an ideal place to put a solar cell, and in, in, indeed, it's one of the best. But there were problems. The first was haze and humidity, which reflected and dispersed the sun's rays. The next was dust, which technicians had to scrape off almost daily. And then there was heat. Right in the middle of the day when the solar cells should have been producing their higher, highest output, they became incredibly hot, which hobbled their out output across the board. Now, in addition to all of these effects, solar cells age. And their output fades by about 1% per year. And newer solar technologies uh, can degrade even more rapidly. But an even larger surprise awaits solar cell owners. Eventually, their solar cells will stop working. And that's because a key component of the solar system, the inverter, will eventually fail. Here's what an inverter looks like. They need to be replaced every five to 10 years in a solar system. And luckily, any licensed electrician can easily swap one out. But unfortunately, each one costs about as much as a new furnace. So incidentally, there's one more reason that solar cells can stop working. It, they get st stolen off, <laughs> off of your roof, uh, like Glenda Hoffman, who woke up one morning uh, to discover 16 of her panels had been taken. Now, her insurance company covered the claim, which was about $95,000 US. Uh, but nevertheless, she intends to protect the new panels herself. And this is what she told the New York Times. <laughs> now, a lot, of the, a lot of people say that the demands of solar cells are worth it in order to avoid the threats of climate change. If solar cells yield less CO2, then does this offer a justification for subsidizing solar? Well, first, we have to consider cost. Even the most expensive options for dealing with CO2 would become cost competitive long before today's solar technologies. 
which makes solar cells look like a wasteful strategy. So why would we want to mitigate one ton with solar when we could mitigate five tons or ten tons elsewhere for the same cost? Now, there's also another issue with greenhouse gases that comes up with solar. These greenhouse gases uh, are used to make solar cells, and they make CO2 look harmless. These greenhouse gases are 10,000 to 23,000 times more potent than CO2, according to the IPCC. And we are now learning that the solar industry is one of the fastest growing emitters of these gases. Now, I had to explain the solar cell demands to my client. The solar cells demanded that we retrofit the roof. They demanded expensive locks and insurance. They demanded regular cleaning. They demanded expensive inverters every five to 10 years. They demanded a lot of money. And they demanded an expensive funeral in a toxic waste plot. And of course, they demanded that those pesky trees would be chopped down. Now think for a moment, what would you have advised my client to do? Here's how the numbers looked. For every $100 he spent on solar cells, the solar panels would produce uh, about this much energy. And for every $100 he spent on LED lighting, he would save this much energy. And the values of the trees, the added insulation, and efficient appliances would be even greater. In the end, I advised my client against a solar cell installation and recommended moving that money toward energy reduction techniques. And the long story short is that I was fired. <laughs> so. Now he had already made his decision. The solar cells would stay and the trees now, my experience was not unique. Uh, a solar company in Ontario instructs owners to go ahead and chop down trees uh, because solar cells are greener. The oil company BP cut down 42,000 trees in New York for a solar array. And a company removed five acres of trees in New Jersey for a solar array to power a facility that makes plastic bags. I kind of think that puts a new spin on paper versus plastic. But. Again, we might think it's worth it to offset dirty coal use. But it's important to note that none of these solar projects will offset the CO2 debt from clear cutting the land that they sit on for reasons that we will come to shortly. The solar cells also won't replace the other benefits of those forests, such as air cleansing, water filtration, trails, and other benefits. So the fate of these trees is a casualty of a certain way of thinking, a presumption that the way to solve our energy problems is to produce more energy. Now, the ethical implications of this remind me of a movie that I recently saw. Uh, has anyone seen 2001 A Space Odyssey? Oh, I have some people in the back that have seen it. So you might remember that there was a computer named Hal. Now, Hal was programmed to carry out a certain mission, and he followed that mission without consideration of the changes around him and without consideration of human life. Hal thought, if the astronauts are endangering the mission, then turn off their life support. If the trees are blocking the solar cells, then cut down the trees. This is a kind of mission-directed ethical trap that we sometimes fall into because we're human. And that's because we typically think that we have a good idea, a good understanding of our ethical ideals. And our task is to apply them to the world. But ethical thinking often involves more than that. It's more than just a mission. It also involves looking at the world to sometimes reevaluate our ideals. But there's a lot that can get in the way. For instance, when I spoke with my client about the house, I made the mistake of thinking that the facts could speak for themselves. I failed to understand that this wasn't about the facts. This wasn't about whether or not my crude calculations were right or wrong. This was about something else. Now, we've been told that solar cells are clean, and we know energy from the sun is limitless. We've been promised that they will be cheap, We've been seduced by solar cells. And this isn't the first time that this has happened. For generations, our energy bucket has been leaking. 
and the leaks represent energy waste. But that's not all. The, the leaky bucket is also getting larger. And that's because we love cheap energy and politicians subsidize energy production. And when cheap energy is available, of course, people want more of it and demand grows. And so it brings us right back to where we started with high demand and so-called insufficient supply. This applies to alternative energy as well. And in fact, there's no evidence that alternative energy capacity offsets fossil fuel use at all in the United States or most likely in Canada, although the Canadian context is different for several reasons, which we can uh, talk about later. I know this doesn't seem to make sense at first, but consider the expansion of hydropower and nuclear power in the United States. They would both presumably decrease coal use. And as recently as 1950, hydropower filled a third of the nation's electrical grid. But nuclear and hydropower did not quench increasing demand. And demand increased. And the United States met that demand by building more fossil fuel plants, not fewer. Now today, hydropower in the United States fills just 7% of the grid. Now this is a boomerang effect. The harder we throw energy into the grid, the harder demand comes back to hit us on the head. And larger solar cells and taller wind turbines are just ways of throwing the boomerang harder. Long ago, we, we found that in the industrialized world, there's, there's these attempts to throw the boomerang harder. And so we poured more energy into the leaky bucket in hopes that we would quench the leaky bucket. And long ago, whale oil was considered cheap and uh, clean and limitless. And one whale might contain three tons of oil. And so we poured that into the bucket. Eventually, whales were in short supply. And they were expensive. But explorers had found something better. Their fossil fuels were cheap. They were cleaner than whale oil. And as any driller could tell you, they were limitless. But uh, that was still not enough to fill the leaky expanding bucket. And physicists had found something else. Nuclear power was cheap, clean, and limitless. Well, that turned out not to be the whole story. Uh, but the bucket was still growing and leaking, which brings us to the next. Now, there are ways to stop the boomerang effect, and there are ways to lower fossil fuel demand. And we'll consider those soon. But first, I have some questions for you about this bucket. What amount of solar energy will fill that leaky, expanding bucket? Will this much do it? What if we double or triple the amount of solar cells in North America? We could probably do that. It would cost a lot of money, but we could do it. What if we multiply the number of solar cells by 100? Now, that incidentally would bankrupt the federal governments of both the United States and Canada. What if we added in 10,000 utility-scale wind turbines? Would that fill the bucket? Or will it fuel the bucket's growth and make us even more reliant on fossil fuels? Now, common knowledge presents or presumes that we have a choice between fossil fuels and green tech. But alternative energy technologies rely on fossil fuels through every stage of their life. Alternative energy financing relies ultimately on economic growth that fossil fuels provide. Alternative energy technologies rely on fossil fuels for raw minerals extraction and for fabrication for installation and maintenance, for backup, and for decommissioning and disposal. And at that point, there's even a larger question, because where will we get the energy to build the next round of solar cells and wind turbines? Wind is renewable, but turbines are not. Alternative energy technologies rely on fossil fuels throughout the entire system. They are a product 
of fossil fuels. They thrive within economic systems that are themselves reliant on fossil fuels. Now, I'm no fan of fossil fuels. Uh, they're finite and they are dirty, but we use them for five principal reasons. Fossil fuels are dense, they are storable, they're portable, they're fungible, which means they can be traded, traded and exchanged, and they are transformable into other products, such as fertilizers and plastics. Now, these qualities cannot be measured in kilowatts. So what happens when we spend our finite fossil fuels to build more alternative energy capacity? Well, then we get energy that is not dense, but diffuse. It is not easily storable, it is not easily portable, it is not fungible, and it is non-transformable. And to increase the quality of that energy, we have to expend even more fossil fuels to build batteries, backup power stations, and other infrastructure. And this is, of course, incredibly expensive. And a lot of that expense is a reflection of the fossil fuels that are used behind the scene. There's an impression that clean energy could supply a growing population of high consumers. And there's an assumption that moving to wind and solar will offset fossil fuel use. But the evidence doesn't support that. Now, before I move on, I should mention by at this point in the story, my architectural firm is Toast. And, but luckily, I'm, I'm somewhat nerdy and willing to spend long periods of time in front of a computer. And so from 2003 to 2008, when gas prices shot up, as you may remember, I stayed safely in the library. <laughs> as part of my academic research, I studied a data set of 50,000 articles on energy that were written over those years when the energy prices shot up. And for every doubling in oil prices, coverage of wind, solar, and biofuels shot up an average of 400%. But I also looked at energy reduction technologies, home insulation, light rail, and LED bulbs. We've witnessed the impressive payoff of these strategies, and so we might have expected them to gain an equal amount or maybe even more media attention, but here's what it looked like. And this was not just a media phenomenon. Does anyone recognize this building? This is a green building in Chicago's Millennium Park. And to be a green building, the architects might have super insulated this building. But instead, they used glass, which allows the building to bake in the summer and lose heat in the winter. They might have outfitted the building with energy efficient lighting, uh, but they didn't. They might have incorporated overhangs to block the high summer sun but allow the winter sun to shine in. They might have used light shelves to toss more light into the building's interior, but they did none of these things. This building is a green building because it has solar cells. The California Academy of Sciences building has solar cells in one of the foggiest microclimates on Earth. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation has solar cells that are partly shaded by the structure itself. And this BP station has solar cells and some don't even face the sun. Here are some solar cells right here on the UBC campus and they also don't face the sun. In fact, None of these buildings have solar cells that face the sun. But you see, that doesn't really matter. Because the architects were not building buildings to be energy efficient. They were not building buildings that were going to reduce fossil fuel use. They were building temples. Temples to technology. Temples to solar cells. Temples to the idea that the way to solve our energy problems is to produce more energy. Now consider for a moment that solar puppy were, or solar power were a puppy, excuse me. Maybe a chihuahua, maybe a furball like this one. If solar power were a puppy, I expect this is something like what it might look like. Uh, not real big, not real smart, but super cute. <laughs> and we all like to take solar for a walk. And academics get grants for walking solar. Industry gets good PR for walking solar. Government enjoys being out for a stroll with solar as well. And when elections roll around, all the more reason to go out for a walk with solar. Media walks solar, so does public. And even I am fascinated by solar cells, and I doubt that I'm the only person in this room that is. 
Now, sometimes being just a puppy, solar gets tired. But there's always someone around to pick up solar and keep going, even if it's just to go to the park and walk in circles. So now let's consider the walk with energy reduction. Now, reduction is a huge dog with lots of potential, as we have seen. The walks with reduction differ from walks with solar because walks with reduction contain many, many more stops to pee, which is made all that harder without the trees. And why go for walks with reduction when the walks with solar are so much more fun? We need to understand how to organize more walks with reduction that interest more of the dog walkers. And that's going to be a lot more fun than you might think. And that's because we don't have an energy crisis. We have a consumption crisis. And a lot of that consumption goes toward things that do not make us happier or healthier. The real clean energy is less energy. Now, this is a shift in the way of thinking that is not available to many people. And you can't see energy savings in the same way you can see and even worship a solar cell. Sorry. <laughs> now, I set out to build a solar house. But what I did not initially see was that this shabby house with its two oak trees was already a solar house. Alternative energy fetishes have so greatly consumed the public imagination that the most vital and durable solutions remain overlooked and underfunded. But therein lies the opportunity for you. You may be asked to think of environmental solutions in terms of energy production. And when this occurs, you might be willing to ask, is that part of the solution or part of the problem? If we are to understand the ethics of alternative energy, then we must first see what they do. Alternative energy technologies do not clean the air. They don't clean the water. They don't protect wildlife. They don't support human rights, and they don't improve neighborhoods. Alternative energy technologies do not strengthen democracy. They do not regulate themselves. They do not lower atmospheric carbon dioxide. They don't reduce consumption. They don't stop the leaky bucket from growing. Now, we generally associate more power with greater prosperity. But residents of the world's 10 happiest countries use less energy than North Americans do, an average of 40% less than Americans and an average of 30% less than Canadians. These happy countries value architectural techniques that make buildings more efficient and comfortable. They also prioritize bicycling, walking, and transit infrastructure. And finally, successful regions value human rights and health care. And we can discuss why this is relevant in the Q&A if you'd like. In contrast, alternative energy technologies yield low-quality energy and a host of side effects. They do not replace fossil fuels. Rather, they rely on fossil fuels, from their financing to their decommissioning and replacement. Alternative energy technologies are essentially rebranded fossil fuels. Now, what will happen if we start to think about alternative energy in 10 years from now? How will people view it? Will they think of alternative energy as clean, or will they see them as the next round of ecological disaster machines? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't claim to know all of the answers. I'm just another member of the search party like you are. But it certainly seems that there are a lot of unasked questions. And by asking the hard questions, you'll be better prepared than anyone else to address the rocky times ahead. As energy prices become more volatile, you will have the conceptual tools to make a difference. In fact, you will, have, you will find that your skills will be sought after, that they will become necessary. And it's not a question of whether or not we have the technology to create an alternative energy society. The real question is the reverse. Do we have a society capable of being powered by alternative energy? And the answer today is clearly no, because the energy bucket is still leaking and still growing. But we can change that. As the illusions surrounding alternative energies continue to unravel, 
over the coming years, you will have some choices to make. Will you remain rigid in your defense of the green legacy empire? Or will you turn off the life support to protect the illusory mission? Perhaps you will adapt your thinking to the larger challenges that we face. Or maybe you will go beyond adaptation and anticipate those challenges and become a leader in the next green movement. A green movement that is not simply a receptacle for energy firms and car companies to plug into. A green movement that looks beyond the eco gadgets on the stage to address the social and environmental injustices behind the curtain. Clean energy is less energy. And the future of energy will not be a story of solar cells, wind turbines, and biofuels. It will be a story of livable communities, improved governance, health care, and human rights. And it is not enough to say that we would benefit by shifting our focus. Our very relevance and your very relevance may very well depend on it. Thank you very much. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. We actually have, um, what time is it now? Uh, 12.35. Okay, so we have just at an hour for questions. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. That's, uh, so the question is about what other energy efficiency technologies might have I mentioned and are they also clean? And I'm glad you asked, asked that question. One of the reasons I use LEDs, I use LEDs in a lot of my academic research to compare to solar cells in media. And one of the reasons I use them is because they have a lot of the same limitations. Uh, they have similar histories. Uh, they were both used in space programs. They both were developed around the same amount of time. They, were, they both rely on uh, silicon-based uh, kind of computing system manufacturing and that, these types of things. And they all contain heavy metals, both LEDs and, and uh, solar cells. Although with LEDs, it's a lot less for the amount of energy that you save. There's a lot less uh, of that toxic material than in a solar cell. You need a lot more solar cells to create that much energy. So there's a little bit of a difference there. So there are, there are disadvantages, unintended consequences of energy efficiency technologies as well. And one of the big ones is the Jevons paradox, which is that as you make a system more energy efficient, you make that system cheaper and easier to get. And so people want more of it, and they use more of it, and you end up kind of, it's a rebound effect. It comes back and kind of kicks you on the butt with even more demand. So this is both on the supply side and the demand side a problem. It's something that we have to be you know, vigilant about addressing and asking questions about how we're going to address those. And so the first part of your question was, are there other ideas that I have for saving energy? And I have a lot, to, I have like 36 different first steps in the book. I don't propose to have solutions because a lot of the big problems, I don't think that they're, I don't have, I don't know the solutions. I, I don't know the grand narrative or how it will all end. But uh, one of the other, one of the things I like to focus on are solutions that benefit a lot of individuals. Because if we focus on solutions that benefit a lot of different players, then they're more likely to catch on. And one of them that I use in the book is the idea of junk mail. And so, you know, junk mail requires all kinds of processing and printing and chopping down trees and, and hauling to houses where usually it's immediately thrown away and immediately sent, you know, back to a dump somewhere. And so that entire system is highly energy intensive. And so in Germany, they did something similar to what you do here in Canada, except in Germany it's a little bit simpler. They have this little sticker. You don't have to apply for it or anything like that. And I have one right here because I always carry one with me. But uh, this little sticker says, no thanks to junk mail, except it says it in German. <laughs> and you, it's legally binding. So if you put that in your mailbox, they won't deliver junk mail. 
And you might think it's just a sticker because it's just junk mail. It's not that big of a, uh, not that big of a deal. But in fact, this sticker, if introduced in, in North America, would save more energy than all of the solar panels planned and existing combined create. So it gives you a sense for how even a very small reduction, almost insignificant reduction, it seems, can have a much larger impact than something like all of the solar cells. I wish I knew the answer, but I, I at least can say something to that. First, the I really appreciate uh, Emery Levin's idea of megawatts. So that's uh, so yeah. A lot of this kind of follows that that path. Although we do have to be very conscientious of the unintended consequences of uh, the rebound effect or the Jevons paradox that I mentioned earlier, and one of those is economic, in fact, and. Economies, the, the kind of economy that we have, a, the, a, a capitalist economy requires interest on loans. And so that interest must eventually be paid. And in order for that interest to be paid, someone has to be making a profit. So profits ultimately derive from material extraction. So uh, fossil fuels, natural resources, uh, trees, whatever it is that you have to produce something in order to create that profit so that you can pay back the loan. And then they create another loan, more profit. So then you get exponential growth. And so obviously this, all, this can only go on so long. Because if you have exponential growth, if exponential growth is going to be possible forever, uh, then you start to run into a lot of problems if you start to think that way. And we're starting to find that out now. And a lot of the problems that we have come back to energy. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so. When we think about technology, we tend to think that we, – we think about information technology. And we think about things that follow Moore's law and exponential growth. So we get very comfortable with the idea of exponential growth. But the problem is that energy is not technology. Technology is not energy. And a lot of energy technologies are limited by a 100 percent efficiency ceiling. And so instead of getting exponential growth, you get asymptotic growth, which is it goes up and then it levels off below the ceiling. And so it's a different type of growth that we're not as used to seeing in a world of like iPads and cell phones and information technology and cheap computers. And so eventually that will catch up with us. And if exponential growth were possible, then well, why would be be using up all of the fossil fuels. And if exponential growth were possible, then why would there be CO2 accumulating in the atmosphere and causing problems? I mean, if, if exponential growth were possible, then why are we following the path of failed civilizations? So the question is about uh, where does governance come in to the story here? And also, if there's uh, about the sticker example that I gave earlier. So yeah, the sticker example, my understanding, and I don't live in Canada, is that you do have the red dot sticker and that it, it's somewhat effective but not completely effective. And in Germany, you don't need to apply or fill out a form or anything like that. You just have to put a sticker on your mailbox. And green pieces in Germany uh, on every street corner about once a year are giving out the stickers to make sure everyone has one. So governance is going to be – I have a whole you know, couple chapters where I deal with governance and the types of 
the types of ideas that we can approach with governance. Ultimately, one of the big problems with governance as a solution, not that it isn't a large part of the solution, but one of the big hurdles is that politicians get elected for saying fancy things like uh, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to create that for you, I want to, you know, we're going to have this and that and it's going to be great. But all of that requires energy and so they realize this and they're very interested in, you know, keeping the energy flowing because if the energy isn't flowing then none of their ideas are going to happen. And so when they get elected they're willing to say and maybe even believe, it's difficult to know, uh, things that are based in fantasy. And until we are able to get to the point where we can ask the right questions of our leaders uh, to kind of break through that illusion, uh, I think that's, that's going to be a large part of, before we can get to the point where governance is going to have a large effect, we have to get to the point where we can ask our leaders those questions. We had a question. So the question is, are recycling programs also a green illusion like solar cells? Or, and also the symbolic impact of solar cells that you brought up, which is great, that solar cells do have this, this symbolic value that goes far beyond their utility value. That you put solar cells in your house, you're green. You put solar cells on a building, it's a green building. And it's... Well, I'll go right to your question directly. Is recycling the same thing? Recycling is a complex issue because you also take energy, it takes energy to recycle materials. And so the real issue is, does it take more energy? Is it worth it to spend that energy to recycle the materials? Or is it better to go out and get the virgin material uh, from someplace in another country or something like that? And almost all the times from, from the research uh, that I know of, it, then there's a net benefit to recycling in almost all cases. And part of that is also reflected whenever it's, uh, whenever it's profitable to recycle, that's usually an indication that it's greener, actually, because you're, you, that means that someone's making money on it, someone's not spending as much fossil fuel energy in order to get that benefit uh, that someone else would have to pay to go out to some other country and get more of that uh, material and bring back. So. Yeah, there's, there's balances to be made, and there's definitely questions to ask there, but on balance, uh, recycling is not a green illusion. <laughs> so no, you're not wasting your time. That's, as far as I know of the research, if anyone knows of something different, please come up and talk to me about it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, thank you for that comment. It's, uh, I, I'm sure I would probably find things to argue with both of them on, but. <laughs> so, yeah, your, your point is well taken, and I do think campaign finance reform is one of the largest steps that, that we can take, especially in the United States, which is a context that I'm more familiar with, um, which is. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is a big concern of mine. It's an interest of mine. After a case in the United States that we have called Citizens United, uh, I was out, you know, picketing in front of the banks with the occupiers. So it's it's a it's an issue that's an important issue and one that I think that we should yeah be focusing on as environmentalists also. Uh, Yeah, my. Yeah. So I have covered solar energy today just because it's a convenient place to start. But of course, I talk a lot more uh, about it in the book. But I'm not, I have nothing against solar cells at all. I mean, solar cells are fine. I'm kind of fascinated by solar cells and always have been. Uh, my problem is in understanding them to be clean. That's really my problem is with that illusion that they are clean. Now, it's fine to put solar cells on a porta potty or on a calculator, but it doesn't make it a clean porta potty or a clean calculator because it has solar cells. And that's kind of the illusion that I'm trying to break through. So, but I take your point that I do kind of harp on solar cells a lot in the talk today, so. <laughs> Yeah, it, so the question is, is the, the, you still have to create the energy somehow. We're still going to have society, whether it be, we become efficient, maybe at the same time we should also be building uh, energy capacity that's cleaner than fossil fuels, you know, at least if it's not perfect. Is that basically kind of, yeah. So there's a couple, you know, things that I would have to say about that. The first one, and I do cover this a lot more in the book, your, your questions, than I did in the talk, but... One would be that there's a presumption that solar cells are somehow different than fossil fuels, that the, and, and they really aren't. I mean, really, solar cells are just kind of rebranded fossil fuels, a different type of fossil fuel in a different form. And my point is not to say that there is no parachute. I mean, there's, there, there's a parachute, but it's full of holes. And so I would like to sh point out that that those holes are kind of plain to see, and you don't really have to look that far beneath the surface to find them. And I interviewed a lot of experts uh, for my book, and I've, I interviewed people at the Department of Energy, uh, people at wind power firms. Uh, I followed firms like Nextera, uh, who together with GE just built a, a fossil or a biofuel plant here in, uh, on the UBC campus, which we can talk about, but also a green illusion, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but <laughs> I found from interviewing these people that the disadvantages and limitations of alternative energy technologies are well understood by people in the field. And those people that are most intimately, in, intimately involved with these technologies seem to understand a lot of the limitations of them. 
uh, that there's some things get, that get in the way of communicating that to a, a greater public. One of them is that there's silo effects. So people become specialized in one part of the technology and they become, they know about the problems and side effects and disadvantages and stuff like that, but they think, okay, well, I'm just, I need to work on this one part of the technology to make that better. Then there's also uh, financial interests. I mean, jobs are at stake, reputations are at stake, and these sorts of things. Uh, and then there's the sense that people want to be constructive, and they want to fit in with their peers, and they want to fit in with other people in the industry, they want to fit in with environmentalists, uh, with their neighbors. And so questioning an alternative energy ends up being kind of like raising your hand in church to ask the obvious questions. And uh, you don't go to church to ask questions. Uh, you go to church to believe. And that's what we're doing with alternative energy technologies. We're going to church and believing. And so my point is not to say that energy technologies are bad or that they're useless or that we shouldn't do R&D. I believe we should do R&D. But to just point out and ask that we have to ask some more critical questions. Okay, so in the back row, uh, right behind you, and then one row down, and then over here. Uh, in the red. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Sorry, um, you all, yeah, you cannot, you, you need energy. We cannot always use fossil fuels, so we have to find an alternative. I would agree with that. Yeah, the fossil fuels are going to run out. They're like a giant piggy bank. And, you know, Mother Nature puts a nickel into the piggy bank every week, but we have set up drilling rigs and stuff like that on top of the piggy bank and we're taking a do out a dollar a week. And we've been taking out a dollar a week for a really long time. And so the piggy bank is getting empty, but Mother Nature is still only putting in just like that nickel a week. And so now we're starting to shake the piggy bank. We're shaking the piggy bank uh, in New York in the United States where they're doing fracking. We're shaking the piggy bank in Canada and the tar sands. And we're trying to get, you know, still get that dollar a week out. Uh, but eventually the piggy bank will be empty. And then what will we do? I don't know. But those are the kinds of questions like your question that we need to be asking. What are we going to do with that? Get to that point. We won't be using solar cells and wind turbines, that's for sure, because those need fossil fuel. They cost more. As energy prices go up, they become more expensive to create. As energy prices go up, economies go into turmoil, and you no longer have funds to spend on those. And this is all connected. The economy the cost, the energy cost, it all boils down to that one thing, which is that we're running out of fossil fuels. We're running out of the easy access to them. And we're going to see more manifestations of this in the future. And we're going to also find that more of the illusions surrounding green technologies are going to start to pull apart. There won't be as much support for them because people will see them as producing very little energy and not being uh, you know, cost efficient. And so it will come, it will manifest in various ways. People will say they're not cost efficient. People will say they're dirty. People will, you know, there will be different reasons, but ultimately it comes down to the same thing, that we're running low on the fossil fuels and it manifests in various ways. So eventually we have to find some other alternative. We have to find another alternative, but it might not be on the production side. And if we don't find a way to curb our own use of energy, which is basically based on two variables, population and consumption. If we don't find a way to bring those down to a level where we can be using the five cents a week that Mother Nature is putting into the piggy bank and not taking out more than that, if we don't find a solution to that, uh, then Mother Nature will take care of the problem. And we won't probably be very keen of those techniques.
Thank you for that question. The question is about the debt that fossil fuel uh, or that utilities are carrying and also how the benefits of energy efficiency would be shared. This is a growing interest of mine, and it, it becomes very messy. I mean, the deeper you get into it, the messier it becomes. And I, wasn't, I was not aware that the, the debt carried by utilities is that high, so I'll have to look into that. I wrote it down here, so I can't really speak to that. There's definitely a disconnect between the way benefits from energy are shared across populations and even within uh, countries, and then also the way that the risks and side effects are shared among people as well. And all of those issues are going to become larger issues for the environmental movement to address. The environmental movement is already finding itself in a place where it's being expected to take care of problems with global climate change. And I think that will extend to economic problems as well as we start to see even I, – I suspect there will probably be even a wider gap between the haves and haves not, have nots with regard to energy and the benefits that are achieved from energy. And then in the flip, the reverse, the, the side effects that are – the burdens that are carried. Uh, and that's going to be something that the environmental movement is going to have to become more involved with and uh, is going to be forced to be involved with. And, and a lot of those – Problems cannot be solved with technology. They, they require more than just technology, uh, but a lot of other social, uh, political, economic methods. Well, I'd just like to add one comment, particularly about the technology and people falling in love with technology. But people in the utilities fall in love with it. They also are looking for quick fix. And that's uh, what I'm thinking people might be thinking about that. But there's a lack of research in the mentioned that, yeah, you, you think we'll need to shift from fossil fuels to something else because they're going to run out. But really, I think the issue is we're consuming much CO2, and um, like Bill McKibben just wrote a great article at Rolling, Rolling Stone um, in which he talks about there's already five times the, um, the oil reserves that we, that, that we know of that we can, what we could actually burn and still meet our Okay. Yeah, so the question uh, for those who you couldn't hear is basically the, the question about population. How do we shrink the bucket if population and expectations in developing economies are growing? And then also, if not fossil fuels, then what is the shift? Where can the shift go to? And to start out with the issue of population, I, f I feel that uh, unsustainable population growth is ultimately a symptom of suboptimal social conditions. And in the United States, we have a big problem with that uh, because we have not only a population of high consumers, uh, but a population that's growing. And of course, a growing population on its own, depending on where it is, is not necessarily that big of a deal depending on the time frame involved. Uh, but when you multiply it by Walmart, that becomes a much bigger issue. And that's what we do you know, in the United States. So the United States has a, has a growing population. The rate of that growth has been increasing for a couple decades now. And Americans are very high consumers. So the way to deal with that, in my mind, uh, is through human rights and health care. And in areas of the world where those two things exist, uh, population growth, unsustainable population growth, is not a problem. 
And so the, the key is to get, I think, those two things into place. And then coming back to uh, the idea of fossil fuels and we'll need something else to fill the bucket. I agree, well, we would presumably want something else to fill the bucket, but uh, solar cells and wind turbines and biofuels are not going to do it because they're basically just different forms of finite materials. They're either like fossil fuels or the forests uh, are a different type of finite, you know, uh, uh, finite energy source uh, that are available. So it is possible if, if we are not able to reduce uh, consumption, it is possible that we will start, uh, you know, cutting down the forests. And that would be, you know, kind of the last straw. When societies start to cut down their forests, you know they're close to the end. And that's already happening in Canada. It's happening in the United States. It's happening in Brazil. Uh, and who knows if that will accelerate. Uh, it looks like it probably will. And then the other wild card here is nuclear power. So if you fill up a lot of the grid with nuclear power, then you have, you know, the, the effects of nuclear power, which are different. You can't really compare those to CO2. Uh, well, first of all, it takes a lot of energy to produce a nuclear power plant. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to, to keep it going, and then all the decommissioning activities that go on afterwards. And so you just deal with a different set of side effects, proliferation, nuclear waste, contamination, and fallout risk. And it's difficult to kind of compare those to CO2. Like, how do you... Say how much fallout risk is equal to how much CO2. What do you think hydro fishing is? Is that it is one of the sort of renewable sources where you actually can store energy waste like, like pumping up uh, water for hydro fish and things like that? Absolutely. Um, hydro is a big part of Mother Nature's five cents a week. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a question here and then two in the mic. So the question is, what do we do if not capitalism, if not exponential growth, then what's left? Well, where do we go? There, I, I don't know, first of all. <laughs> I don't know where we're going to go, and I don't know how it's going to roll out. Uh, I, I suspect that we're going to have to find ways of approaching ideas that are brought up by people in the degrowth movement. I don't know how you approach those politically, and I don't know how you institute those types of changes before a crisis, because presumably we would want to plan and prepare for uh, the decrease in fossil fuel uh, consumption that is inevitable. But whether or not we're able to do that, I don't know. Yeah. But I think those are the kind of the places that we should be looking for, for solutions and also try to find ways of making it politically pal palatable or palatable to people. Uh, or get the message, really, get the story right so that we can get people behind them, so that they elect politicians who instead of say things about that are based in fantasy are actually willing to say, you know, m maybe tell a different type of story. Yeah, the solar cell technology costs are dropping, but the installed costs have not. And that's installed costs are really what we have to look at because that's the, the solar cell in the field or on the house. Well, uh, I should argue around the heat because my, my costs have dropped. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm using data from the Department of Energy based on installations in, in California, yeah, large, large scale. So, I mean, any individual, I never really speak about individual projects because it's certainly plausible that uh, an individual project could have a lower cost at one point than another point. So, yeah. Okay, anyone else? Or in the future?
So the question is, is there about carbon markets and whether or not those would make sense in North America, is that the source of a lot of our problems? And carbon markets do themselves have some side effects. And one of them is that carbon markets can squeeze production to those technologies that are not covered by the carbon tax, things like wind turbines, solar cells, nuclear power. And so from that respect, a vote for carbon taxes is essentially a vote for nuclear power because solar cells and wind turbines are, are relying on the fossil fuels and becoming expensive. And so that's one thing, that's one place where, oh, it's the case because of the way the policies are designed. So when carbon, uh, the nuclear industry is very invested in, in carbon taxes because it taxes everyone except for them. And so the policies could be arranged in a way where you have an energy tax instead of a carbon tax. And if you had an energy tax, then you would also be taxing nuclear and you wouldn't have to worry about the rebound effect and squeezing energy. Just you squeeze one part of the market and then all the energy goes over to the nuclear power uh, companies. And Well, Germany is an, an, an interesting case because Germany has shut down its nuclear power plants, but now is importing nuclear power from the Czech Republic. In fact, there's a, uh, there's a nuclear energy boom in the Czech Republic right now. They're building more nuclear energy plants in the Czech Republic so they can send them the energy back to Germany. And then the other, interest, uh, the other thing we have to remember in the German case is that German has sent a lot of its energy intensive manufacturing facilities overseas, which is one of the reasons their carbon dioxide uh, footprint has decreased significantly. So what they do is now Germans buy the products that are created overseas uh, outside of the carbon trading market, and then the products are bought, brought back in. So the, you know, it's just a roundabout kind of way of getting around things. But this, you're, in some cases, yeah, in some cases and not another, but your point is a very good one in that these things have to be global, and they have, you have to have some kind of uh, lock on the whole system. And a carbon market, I think, is a first step in that direction. I would like to see energy markets rather than just carbon. And even though I'm critical of the capitalist model, I think it's important to separate markets from capitalism, uh, capitalism being kind of the, the consolidation of wealth and then the markets being the simple kind of old-fashioned kind of market where you trade goods among various people. And I think when we start to make that separation, we can also start to think a little bit more clearly about what's at stake in a market and how do we see a market, how do we create a market that's fair and equitable to people? Because another problem with carbon markets is that it can end up shoving some side effects to parts of the world that are, uh, are unable to could kind of be involved with as closely with the uh, creation of those carbon markets. Um, that's another thing to be aware of, but something that can probably be remedied by, you know, being cognizant of that.
So the question is about whether or not the alternative energy technologies also have the side effect of creating a kind of social cohesion in and um, in talking about energy efficiency and broader environmental issues rather than just energy production. And I would say that you're probably you're probably absolutely right. They, they do make people more thoughtful about the energy that they're using and and those uh, sorts of things. The, that's an incredibly expensive way of creating a dialogue, and, and it's also somewhat delusional because to think that the, so to think that the wind turbines are doing anything or making you self-sufficient is in itself an extreme delusion uh, because uh, you can't build a wind turbine, for instance, without rare earth metals, and they don't have rare earth metals in, in, in where was it, the Denmark. Denmark, yeah. I'm quite certain they don't have rare earth mines on the island. So, and that's just, I mean, that's just one part of the puzzle. There's a lot of reasons why uh, they still have that cord connecting them to the mainland. And it's also the reason why there's no place uh, in the industrialized world where uh, there is a self-sufficiency-based uh, economy on renewable energy technology. So I will, t I will accept your point, though, that 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 that's a side effect that would be a positive side effect of these energy technologies. Whether it's not worth rolling them all out with all of their side effects and unintended consequences on the other side in order to get that benefit, I don't, I don't really think that's worth it, but I could certainly see where a New Yorker writer might think it is. So. So the question is about uh, whether or not it makes sense to kind of critique fossil or critique alternative energy technologies when really they could you know, be creating progress, uh, and also the issue with CO2 and climate change. And by critiquing alternative energy technologies, are am I uh, kind of kind of putting a hurdle in front of getting action on climate change? So. For the, for the first part of it, uh, there, you know, I could give everyone LSD and we could think about progress and what it would be like to live without fossil fuels. I mean, these are, these technologies in my mind are illusions. I mean, they, they are like a drug and I call them pornographic in my book and I have a whole chapter on why they're pornographic. And it's because they're based in fantasy. They're based in ideas and fantastical ways of thinking that are not likely to be achieved in reality. And fantasies are fine. Uh, you know, you, they spur creative thought and these sorts of things. But the problem is when those fantasies start to become taken as serious by politicians, by environmental leaders, and they start to narrow the questions that we even think to ask. And that's really my problem with alternative energy technologies is that's what they're doing. So the effect that they're having, they may make us feel very good. I'm not arguing with that. But it's a drug high. And with regard to climate change, I mean, there's no evidence that 
solar cells and wind turbines are making any progress toward mitigating climate change. In fact, there's quite strong and persuasive evidence to counter that uh, very argument. Uh, if we look at a, a report recently uh, by Richard York from the University of Oregon, did a study, uh, and it's backed up by some research that I've done as well. Uh, he was, he, his study was published in, in Nature, so it, this, it was a pretty big study. And then uh, it's also backed up by kind of um, economic models and uh, social behavior models and uh, historical models as well. And all of these uh, various studies and approaches show that probably alternative energy technologies like solar cells and wind turbines don't uh, decrease fossil fuel use and decrease carbon emissions, but actually accelerate carbon emissions. And that's because you have all of the fossil fuels that you're, you're using, and then you're adding on the solar cells and adding on the wind turbines. And those all have a carbon footprint of their own. They're not CO2 neutral. They're not clean. They all have environmental effects. And you're adding them onto a system of the essentially the, the nominal fossil fuels that we're already using. And so I would say that the, the kind of critique that I'm creating is, is necessary in order to break the illusion that that's doing something, that that is actually reducing carbon dioxide emissions or something like that. Uh, because we have to be able to see more clearly past these alternative energy technologies to see the better solutions, which I say are behind the curtain, the solutions that are up here. Uh, and these are not complete solutions. I call them actually just first steps, you know, ideas to get us moving and thinking in different directions. Ooh, the biggest leaks in the bucket. Probably the biggest leak in the bucket would probably be the transportation system in the U.S. and Canada. And the other, well, yeah, building and, buildings and transportation infrastructure. Those are the two big leaks in the bucket. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's something that's not talked about enough. That we, we think we're going to get away from consuming energy by getting on the mega solar farms and just start flying somewhere. Maybe one guy flies, and those 20 people get off their computers, and now I can get my equal balance of energy consumption. Maybe not. I haven't done the numbers on that. But the point is, information technology is a huge consumer of energy, and I'm wondering if we're not ignoring that. So I'd like to get your comments on that. So the question is about energy consumption of information technologies and an article in the New York Times recently about this topic, which is a wonderful, fascinating investigative piece in the New York Times. I think it came out last week. Is that right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I and I, I highly recommend people to look it up and read it. That's the kind of reporting that I love to see, uh, is this kind of investigative reporting rather than just kind of the recreation of press releases from energy firms. And I, yeah, I, I do think it's part of the puzzle that is being largely ignored, and I'm glad that the New York Times uh, did that study, which they've been working on for a long time, apparently, because of the number of people that they've interviewed and everything. This has been in the works for a really long time to create this piece. And I won't say anything more than that on it, because I, it's not a focus of my research, uh, but I found the article to be engaging. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. 
So the question is about developing economies and are we on a misguided path of installing solar cells, for instance, in rural areas that are not connected to the grid? And I don't, like I said before, I don't have a problem with solar cells themselves. And I have a problem with someone putting solar cells in a remote community and saying that that community is green. I don't have a problem with so, someone putting solar cells in a community that's not, a, uh, not uh, connected to the grid so that people can get rid of their sooty candles and dangerous lanterns uh, it, so that they can read at, light, at night to get an education. Calling it green is a different step though. So I guess that's kind of how I feel uh, about that issue. That it, it's highly context dependent. It depends where you're going to put a technology and how you're going to use it. That's an extremely expensive way to power uh, a community. And so it's not really scalable. So you could, if you have a community of a couple dozen people, they could greatly benefit if some benefactor came in and, and provided that. But as far as connecting a billion people in India to solar, it's not going to happen. And, and then you, you'll always come back to fossil fuels. And the solar cells are just another rendition of that, a very expensive rendition of fossil fuels. Oh, thank you for asking about appliances and the energy efficiency of appliances. So uh, I don't know what's coming, but I do, I do hope that uh, essentially in the, in the United States at least, there was an issue with, uh, in the 1970s with refrigerators. And refrigerators used to consume a lot of energy. And in, in fact, if refrigerators still consume the same amount of energy today as they did in the 1970s, we'd need something like an extra 30 power plants running around the clock at full tilt in order to supply just that difference. And the way they got around it is just to put a sticker on the refrigerator that shows how much energy it used. And by creating that transparency, it gave consumers a way of comparing how much they were going to spend on the refrigerator up front and then some concept of how much they were going to spend every year thereafter. And even though humans are rotten judges of long-term value, it was enough to instigate a change. And so what's going to happen in the future with, uh, with, with these various appliances, I, I'm not really sure. And, and in, in many ways, appliances are also kind of a, a part of the problem. Uh, if you look at things, you know, a lot of appliances use a lot of energy and are not necessary, like a clothes dryer, for instance, is not really necessary. But if your condo association says you're not allowed to dry your clothes outside, then you need a dryer, uh, which is a problem in, in a lot of places. Uh, that's, that's my answer to that. I'm not really sure what's going to happen in the future, but I'm, I think it's an area of inquiry. Oh, so the question is on my position on geothermal energy. Geothermal is another nice part of the, the kind of nickel that Mother Nature is putting in our piggy bank every week. New, geothermal energy, though, I mean, the, the big limitation, it's, it's, it's just a, an issue of limitations. It's only available in certain locations, and it's not scalable. So maybe we would get up to a few percent uh, of energy capacity or, or something like that, but it's just not scalable beyond that. And, of course, there's side effects as well if you – put geothermal in some places where the resource is weakening. Uh, you have to create or induce earthquakes. And there was a geothermal facility in uh, Switzerland that got shut down because it caused an earthquake in Basel, Basel uh, that was created more damage than uh, the monetary damage than all of the geothermal that had been pumped out of there was worth. So there's that issue. And then there's radioactive compounds and things like that that get dredged up because you're in highly radioactive areas, which is the reason that the rocks are so hot on the ground. So one last question. Uh, talking about the move from the leisure to something practical, if we go back to the uh, German implementation of the SIP uh, thereby, I was uh, with the work spoken to others in the uh, condo. Uh, there are some total of five shippers
So the question is, how does the sticker like this that people can put on their mailboxes in Germany become practical, both from the position of getting people to put it on their mailbox in the first place, and then how does that imprint on the whole cycle as a whole, on the energy impact of the cycle? And so in Germany, the way that they, the reason this is so successful in Germany is because, like I mentioned before, there's people from Greenpeace that are out on the corner every once in a while handing them out, but also because it's very simple. Like, people don't have to do anything more than just put the sticker on their mailbox. It's a simple solution, but it's also simple to do. And in Canada, I believe you have to fill out a form and send it back and then get the sticker or something like that. And then in the United States, we don't have anything like that at all. So part of the trick is to just create something that's so simple and binding that people just put it on. And that's why an overwhelming number of uh, Germans put this sticker on their mailbox. Uh, when I lived in Germany, uh, there were lots of mailboxes in my building, and I don't think any of them didn't have the sticker. Uh, when I came in, my, my mailbox already had, already had the sticker, so I didn't have to put one on. And now how does that translate to the industry as a whole? Well, the junk mail industry in Germany is tiny compared to the United States, even on a per capita basis. And one of the reasons is because if they, they, it's not, it doesn't make very much economic sense for them to send out junk mail when it all you know, gets returned and they have to pay for it. And, and then they find that those few addresses that don't have the sticker and they send it and then those people put up the sticker. And it, so the junk mail industry has kind of been you know, cut due to that. It still gets around in other ways, but it, when you look at Germany compared to the United States, there's a huge difference. So the question is whether or not it just shifted the advertising to some other place instead of causing the net reduction. And I don't know if there would really be any way to measure that. Uh, it, probably advertising shifted to other areas because companies are still going to want to advertise. Whether or not they did that in a way that is less uh, environmentally harmful, it's difficult to imagine something that would be worse than junk mail, like printing all of these things and shipping them out to houses and shipping them to a landfill. That's a really wasteful cycle. But your point is taken that probably a lot of the advertising shifted to other areas. Okay, I would have to, I actually have to go back and look at that because my understanding is that there was a very active junk mail industry and that it was curbed by this. But I would like to double check on that. Thanks for asking. Okay, and then one last comment. Oh, yeah. Having a, a comment, your comment, your comment about the. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. I think it probably is largely cultural. And asking the larger questions about what, are the, what is the function of advertising and do we need it and who does it help and who does it benefit? Who does it? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll be back. Thank you.